Welcome back everyone to Showbiz India and today it is a personal pleasure and honor to introduce Mr. Kailar Satyarthi, Nobel Prize Peace winner. It is such an honor to have you here on Showbiz India. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me here. I saw the film. Very, very hard hitting. But before we talk about the film, a little bit about you. Going back to your childhood, your father was a police officer. Yeah. So going back, when was the first time, can you remember, that it really bothered you about having children being, you know, trafficked and slaves? It was the first day of my schooling. I was five and a half year old and went to school. I saw a cobbler boy sitting along with his father outside the school gate under the open sky. And that has bothered, bothered me. So I asked to my teacher that, sir, why a child is sitting outside and not with the rest of us in the classroom? He said, calm down, this is your first day. Poor children have to work and help the families. I was not convinced. So I asked this question to my parents and friends. Answer was more or less, more or less same. But every morning and afternoon I was looking at this boy and that made me angry and uh, pained. So I kept on gathering some courage to speak to the boy and his father. One day I stopped and the uh, boy was shy, but father said that, sir, I never thought about it. Babuji, I never thought it. Because my father, my grandfather, and I started working since our childhoods, and so is my son, he said. And then he took a pause and answered, Babuji, you guys are born to go to school, but we are born to work like that. And that was even more hard hitting for me. That how some children or why some children are born to work at the cost of their childhood, their education, their freedom. This is unacceptable. That was the first spark. And I started looking the world with a different eye. One is that what the parents or teachers, wise people say may not be true. The truth is beyond that because it is the complacency or rigidity of the mindset which allow us to think that oh it has been there for ages so it will continue like that why it should continue if something is wrong something is wrong so that gave me a different eye and then i found that yes children were working in the street restaurants and other places i wanted to do something for them but i had no idea i was such, such so a young, young child yeah, yeah. yourself yes. then i was a little bit uh, grown up i started collecting some some money out of our pocket money to pay the fee of those who were um, poor children and bound to leave schooling. I started collecting some old books, used books, so that they could be given to those children, they can continue their studies. That shaped my personality and, and my life for future. Then my parents, of course, uh, had a dream that I should become an engineer. My father was a policeman and he passed away when I was young, so my mother, widow mother, had to struggle hard and my elder brothers and mother had to to put all efforts for my studies. So I passed out as electrical engineer. I graduated from there and I taught in the university. But I realized that I was not doing justice to myself, to my heart. And then I decided to give up the career. That was very, very hard decision in uh, late 80s and early 90s. It was only my wife, Sumedha, who was my partner and companion in it. And she trusted on me, but others tried to convince me that go and open some orphanage for poor children if you really wanted to do charity. But I was not doing charity. Being a system engineer, I started feeling that there are systemic causes for this situation. And it's not simply poverty, this is slavery. This is denial of human dignity and freedom that is unacceptable. This boy has been missing for seven months. The child has been taken, taken to, Delhi. to Delhi. This is quite a dangerous area. We have been attacked there two times. Where are the children? The real path was found when I rescued a group of children, women and men in 19... 81. That was March 1981. I was publishing in a, a magazine, a fortnightly, which was solely dedicated for the cause of children and women and such marginalized 
sections of society. And one day a desperate father knocked my door whose daughter uh, could have been sold to a brothel any moment. His name was Basal Khan. And he came with one wish or one expectation that I should publish his story so that government agencies can, can read and perhaps act. So when I started writing, I was shocked to learn that he and his newly married wife and some other people uh, were lured away from his village near Aligarh to work at a brick kiln in Punjab. And during those 17 years, they were not allowed to leave the brick kiln. They had to live their life in the fenced kiln area. They were not paid anything. All children were born and grew up there, including 15-year-old Sabo. So when he was talking to me, he was lying on my feet, holding my feet, and Babuji, meri Sabo ko bachalo, save my Sabo, save my daughter. And then I started thinking that if she was my sister or my daughter, what would I do? I'm not going to simply write things and wait for some response from an agency. I would have hold the whole world upside, upside down. So I decided and I told him that Basal, I'm going to rescue your daughter because I feel that she is my sister. I was 26 years old that time. So it was a difficult decision because I had, I had no idea what to do. So I collected some friends and I went to Sumedha, my wife, and requested her to give her wedding ornaments so that we can organize some logistics. Somehow, we reached to that brick inn and we were beaten up as shown briefly in, in the, the film, in the documentary, yes. and we were thrown away. We had to come empty hands. But I did not give up. I spoke to some lawyer friends and finally we were able to free not only this beautiful girl, Sabo, but 36 children, women and men. This was the first documented or recorded incident of freeing children and people from slavery in the contemporary world that was picked up by the media, so the national and international media uh, brought this story out. And then I started receiving messages and calls from an anonymous people about the children uh, hold in slavery. Then I never looked back. And I recall that moment of truth in my life when these children were coming back from the high court. They have never seen uh, cars or houses, buildings, roads, anything. They were born, all of them were born there. So that was beyond their imagination. And they were jumping on the streets in freedom, laughing. And the mothers were hugging them, kissing them again and again because mothers could never think that they will ever see their children being freed like that. They were crying out of joy and the tears were rolling down on their, on their faces. And I could feel uh, that this was divine experience, that was a glimpse of God I could see on the faces of those children. Every child should be free to be a child. Free to laugh and cry, free to go to school, free to touch the sky. I have seen that change is possible. Along with the joy of that, unfortunately there is a harsh reality that you had to deal with, that a lot of the children have post-traumatic stress. They're not used to trusting people. And you and your wife have been instrumental in helping that as well. It's not just about freeing the kids, but what happens later. Yeah, I, I, we know right from the beginning that why these children trust others, because they have never experienced love. They have never experienced dignity or respect. They have never experienced that kind of freedom. And nobody has ever came to help them in any manner. They were always abused and exploited. And their parents were abused and exploited back homes. So it is hard, but we have to do it. And that has gone deeper in the entire organization. If you meet the, the director or manager or teachers, instructors of my Mukti Ashram or Bal Ashram or Girls Ashram, then you cannot differentiate who is the, the super boss and who is a parent of a child. Or They all live, eat together, we all play together, we dance, jump, sing together. So it's a larger family. And that sense of protection in a family environment is the most important thing. So if we live with them as their, as their family, then it changes very fast. It takes, of course, few days, sometimes few weeks, 
but eventually it brings and restores the sense of childhood and they feel so empowered that when they go uh, back home, they question other people that why are you sending your children to work? They question caste system, they question some kind of uh, communal tensions in the villages. Because, good for them. Uh, yeah, yeah, good for them, but yes. for that, they're great. Yeah. yeah. So Kalachi, I have to say, I mean, of course I have immense respect for you, but through this documentary, I also got immense respect for your whole family, especially your beautiful, lovely wife, the wind beneath your wings, I would say. And, you know, the fact that she is supporting you in such a noble cause as well, were you not afraid uh, of your own safety at one point? I knew from the day one, even before the day one, that I was embarking upon on an issue which is risky, which is dangerous, because first of all, it was a non-issue, so I, I had to fight against the age-old mindset and complacency in the society, but also the wasted interest, because these people earn huge money, illicit money, by way of engaging them as child laborers or child slaves, or making huge money out of child trafficking and human trafficking. Human trafficking is one of the three largest illicit trades in the world and the latest figures globally show that it has grown as 150 billion dollar uh, illegal earning every year. If you try to compare with the money needed for education of the children in the world, it is merely 22 billion dollars. If we are able to mobilize 22 billion dollars additional funding for our children's education, all children would be attending primary schools every year. And the world is earning $150 billion uh, buying so and sad. selling of children. It's so sad. I knew that this, is, this was a dangerous path because I, have to, I was creating my own path. There was no ready-made path to walk on. One has to put aside the fear, first of all. If you are committed to something, then you have to be honest to that commitment. And that honesty and commitment will rise you away ever from any kind of fear. We knew it that it could happen with my family, with me, and my family members were also grown up. Grown up. My children grew up like that. And, and they I, both are very much um, social yeah, activists as well, are, which is are, wonderful. They, they but are. you got death threats. You broke your back. Yeah. You had a lot of physical injuries. Yes, it, it did. Uh, it happened, but each time they tried to kill me, like I have my broken left foot, I have my broken soldier, I have my broken backbone or my head injuries and so on. But each time I was hospitalized, my wife or my children came to greet me, I was smiling because I, I felt, genuinely I felt that I'm much more powerful than the entire mafia gang. They are frightened with my existence. They are frightened with me, so they wanted to, to kill me. They wanted to get rid of because they are frightened. So why I should become frightened? Why I should be afraid of this thing? Everybody will die one day. Why should they be when you are lying on bed uh, at the age of 80 or 90 and uh, suffering from different ailments? Why you take your cause and then see if you die or alive? And you can see that I'm fine, I'm alive, I'm still active. And more active, perhaps. Absolutely, and it's all those blessings of, I'm sure, thousands of children, Absolutely. over 80,000 children, 87,000. Yes. My God, that's such a such an amazing feat. What can we do as a society to help? What can people who are watching you right now? Well, uh, first of all, we should feel that no problem in the world is an isolated problem and can be solved in silo. The interconnectivity of humanity is key for our own survival. We have learned it partially after 9-11 that the problem could be born in one part of the world and other part of the world which used to feel that they live in the safe heaven has disproven this. And similarly, 20 years ago, people were not really so concerned about global warming or climate change. Now everybody is frightened that it has become suicidal. So we are all concerned about it. So sooner or later, we reach to that situation because we are pushed towards the wall. And then we wake up, oh yeah, we are close to the wall. We could be killed. So why not we learn now that we have to protect our children, we have to educate our children, we have to ensure their safety, freedom and education so that we can create a healthier world. Healthy in the sense of healthy society, uh, which is not driven by 
uh, by narrow mindset, which is not driven by uh, fundamentalism of any kind or uh, violent extremism, where the people should be more compassionate and live with a sense of mutual responsibility. So that world could be created only when we begin with the children. That is, that is very fundamental. But as consumers, people can play a very important role. You can ask to your shopkeeper when you buy your shoe pair or if you buy your apparels or any other things, ask whether you have a guarantee that they are not produced by child laborers. That person would be shocked. What are you talking, madam? But you have to say, yes, I, I wanted to buy only those things which are free of child labor. Then he may pick up the phone call and ask to someone else that there is a lady came with this question, how to answer, and the discussion begin. Awareness is the first step towards transformation or social change. So we have to begin with creating awareness, asking questions. Why is matters a lot? As responsible consumers, one can write and ask to the president of a company that how would you guarantee that uh, your supply chain does not engage child labor. Demands could not be put aside by any company anywhere in the world. And if it goes in thousands or so hundreds of thousands and millions, then definitely they have to go back and see whether the supply chains are clean or not. So we have to put some pressure on them. And we have to also encourage those businesses which are genuinely free of child labor and wanted to be genuine. So that is another possibility. As citizen, one should raise this issue with the local politicians, the congressmen, senators. Once in a while, one can write to the White House. You are the part of many of the decisions taken, including the commitment of sustainable development goals, which calls for total eradication of child labor by year 2025. So in next few years, seven years, the child labor has to be completely eradicated. And that is the collective responsibility of the President of America and the President of Sudan or Prime Minister of India or Prime Minister of Pakistan or whosoever in the world. Everybody is collective, collectively responsible to fulfill that commitment we made for our children in the United Nations. So these questions could be asked by citizens and that will help in creating much more genuine global citizenship. Uh, with a sense of mutual respect and responsibility. One can definitely do smaller things, write blogs, speak out in your own small schools, colleges, universities, talk to the people. There are so many ways to raise this voice because we have to realize that civilization and slavery should not coexist. If we still have one single child slave anywhere on the earth, means we are not yet completely civilized, we are not yet cultured. If one single child is in danger anywhere, means the world is not safe. Because one family member of the human family is still unsafe and that could be a child in Syria or in Yemen or in Afghanistan or anywhere in the world, then the world is not safe. I have seen corruption, injured children with broken spirits. My colleagues and I have freed over 80,000 children, but that is not enough. I have launched a campaign which has been also uh, briefly um, mentioned in the film, 100 million for 100 million. 100 million children, young people, are victims of violence victims of war and insurgencies and conflicts, victims of mass scale migration or displacement due to global warming, victims of acute poverty. 100 million children are denied their childhood. On the other hand, world is so rich with 3 billion young people who are full with energy and enthusiasm, courage. They have a strong element of idealism to do something good for the society. They, if they are given challenge, they are ready to accept it to make this world a better place. So I launched Human History's most ambitious and biggest ever campaign. 100 million young people from schools, colleges, universities, from neighborhoods should take the lead. They should be the champions and change makers for the cause of 
100 million left out sisters and brothers of them. So this way, I'm addressing directly 200 million youth of the world and indirectly all their families. So the families, the parents who are listening to me and watching me, they should also encourage their own children, their sisters and brothers to join this campaign so that these youth should not become disillusioned with the systems and institutions eventually or lost hope or uh, they should not become intolerant or impatient or violent. So let us give them a purpose. Let us bring them on a path with sense of dignity and respect where they can feel that they can make this world a better place. So I call upon everyone to join 100 million, 400 million campaign. This is my call for globalization of compassion. So many things have been globalized. Our products, our thoughts, good technology, market, everything. But this is the time to globalize compassion to save humankind. We cannot save humankind if we don't globalize compassion now. Break the silence. This year's Nobel Peace Prize has gone to Indian Kailash Satyarthi. We cannot end child labor unless we all demand it. March with me. What a powerful message indeed. And uh, from someone like you, what would be the essence of life for you? Essence of life is childhood, Reshma ji. Some people ask me, how would you explain yourself? Who are you, Kailash? I said, I'm a child. Oh no, of course I'm a grown-up child. Why? I answer that for me, childhood is not an age. Childhood is a virtue, is a value. Childhood means simplicity, forgiveness, quest for learning new things. Childhood means transparency and truthfulness. Everybody should keep that childhood alive and a child alive inside us. If we are really forgiving others at this age, or if we really wanted to learn new things, if we really uh, simple, then it is not because we are very educated, we are very rich. It is because a child is still inside you. So don't let that child die. Nurse that child so that the world can be more beautiful as children are. world could be more simple as children are. We, through our knowledge and accomplishments, have made the world so complicated. So for me, I wanted to remain a child. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Again, it's been a privilege and honor to have you on Showbiz India. Thank you. Rescue operations and raids are important, but one tiny part of the whole movement. I have one single mission of my life that every child should be free to be a child. Free to laugh and cry, free to go to school, free to touch the sky. I have seen that change is possible. If you see any kind of abuse and exploitation of any child anywhere, break the silence. This year's Nobel Peace Prize has gone to Indian Kailash Satyarthi. We cannot end child labor unless we all demand it. March with me. March with me.